Um, before we get into uh, the message today, I had something that I would like to share with you. Um, scripture says that my people perish for a lack of vision. And I believe that's as true today as it was for Israel when that was spoken. And I want to share with you a little bit about what my vision for Jesus Community Church is, what I see that God is calling into being here. Okay? Um, this, this is not all of it, but this is something that I, I want you guys to be aware of. Um, a long time ago, I was talking with a gentleman, and, and I don't know if he was quoting someone or it was something he had come up with on his own. I don't know, but he was... We were talking about how ignorant we, we are. Now, ignorance is not, it's not name calling. Ignorance means you don't know. Okay? So when someone says you're ignorant, all they're saying is you don't know something. And, and quite honestly, I would rather be ignorant than foolish. Okay? So, you know, somebody that's foolish revels in their ignorance. Okay? So... He, he described it to me like this. He said, it's as if um, there were a picture hanging on a wall. Most people will gaze at the picture and they can tell you kind of what the picture's about. They might even be able to tell you uh, the type of painting that it is, watercolors, oil, whatever. They might even tell you the genre that it falls under, under you know, impressionist or whatever. Um, so they, they, they look at these pictures but he said, occasionally, you will have somebody that will realize that if there's a picture on a wall, that there's something else in the room. And they'll turn from the picture and they'll look around and they'll see that there's things in this room. And so occasionally, you'll have people whose ignorance will be diminished because they will cease looking at the picture and begin to look at the other things in the room. He said, but then, in even rarer cases, you will have people that will realize, well, if there's a room, there must be a house. And those people will begin to expand beyond the picture, beyond the room, and explore the house. And finally, he said, you have those people that realize, if there's an inside, there must be an outside. And those people will not only take into consideration the painting, the room, the house, but they'll take into consideration the world, okay? One of the things that I really feel that God has laid on my heart for Jesus Community Church is that we have got to get into the world. We have, as a Christian church, and I speak specifically to Jesus Community Church, but generally to the church universal, we have had church inside walls. Okay. We have relegated the omnipresent God to existing in certain areas. We come to church, and that's a God place. We go to uh, fellow believers' houses, and that's a God place. We have certain areas that we might go to that we prefer to spend time in prayer or in the Word or whatever, and those are God places. But... If God exists inside of me, then everywhere I go should be a God place. If God is in fact omnipresent, everywhere I go should be a God place. So one of the things that I really feel like God has laid on my heart is that we have got to quit looking at just this picture. This picture being Jesus Community Church as existing right here in this room. Okay? We've got to realize that there is more that is going on in the work in the kingdom of God than what happens here. That's part of why I'm trying to get pastors to come and talk from other churches. Because I want you guys to start getting a glimpse of what God is doing beyond these walls. I see over and over and over again, I appreciate Dennis sharing what he did this morning because I see over and over again, men of God are hearing the things of God and you're seeing these little lights 
start to flicker everywhere. And it's all the same light. Okay? Now imagine if it weren't just the pastors or the leaders. Imagine if it were just Christians. Estimates still put Christianity at about two-thirds of the population of America, about 66%. Some go as high at 80%. Okay? People professing to be Christians. Obviously, that's not the case. And I say obviously because look where we are as a nation. The things of God have been relegated and placed within walls, within confines. Hey Amen. I'm a Christian, but that's at church. Keep your Christianity out of the office. Keep your Christianity out of the workplace. Keep your Christianity out of whatever event you happen to be. That's fine. That's you and God. It's personal. Wrong. It starts off personal. But it has got to become public. The whole point of baptism is a public affirmation of what God has done. God has already come into you and he has changed you. And you are telling the world this, this symbol of me going under the water, being buried with him, and then being resurrected anew is the start of something new. I am no longer who I was. I have become a new creation. And so one of the things that I, I am absolutely convinced, almost to the point of panic, is that each of us, and notice I'm not pointing fingers this way, because I, I'm in this boat too. Each of us has got to get out of this carefully tailored area that we built to contain our Christianity. And it has got to go out into the world. It's got to be a part, so much a part of our fabric, so much a part of our daily lives that everyone we encounter has no question. Whether it's good or bad, they know where you are. Whether they go, hey, a fellow believer, fantastic. A brother in Christ, a sister in Christ, absolutely. Or they go, ew. That's what we have got to do. Look, Jesus said that the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Pray to the Lord of the harvest that he might send laborers into the field. All right? Now, we take that, and I guarantee you, the majority of the people in this room heard what I just said and thought of somebody else going into the field. I won't ask for hands. Okay? Because for probably 99.8% of my life, that was me. I'm willing to pray, God, send somebody else. Okay? But the Great Commission kind of tells us really who that somebody is, doesn't it? Because the Great Commission is, you know, the Great Commission is not new. God gave the Great Commission to the people of Israel when he founded them as a nation. He said that through you, I am going to bless the world. Do you know that anybody that came into Israel was to be treated exactly the same as the Israelites? They were not to be treated any differently. Okay? The Great Commission is only new to us. And he says, as you're going, preach. Okay? Now, I don't know about most of you guys. I used to know a lot of sign language. When I was little, I had hearing problems. And they turned out it wasn't actually my ears, it was my brain. Lap it up. Okay? Okay? Um, but I, I learned a lot of sign language. I, I learned to read lips. And if you watch, whenever the room's crowded, I'm staring at your mouth so I can try and understand what you're saying. But preaching has got to involve some form of communication. Okay? Some form of talking, communicating, has to take place. We've heard the saying, preach always. If necessary, use words. I hate that saying. I believe absolutely that the testimony of our lives 
should simply undergird the testimony of our mouths. That you should live your life in such a way that when you give words to what you feel and what you believe and what you think, your life already attests to that. Okay? So, part of my vision is that we have got to take the fire, get it out from underneath the bushel, and put it out into the dark. The majority of the church today only brings their candles out when they're in a well-lit room with other candles. And as soon as we walk out that door, boop, we put it back under our candle. And, you know, if we come to someone that we think might be a Christian, we might let it peek a little. If they don't respond, boop. If they do respond, oh, oh, oh yay! Oh, stranger. <laughs> and both of you, boop. Okay? We have got to let our light burn brightly. There's no other way around it. Okay? So that's part of my vision, is we have got to get our thinking beyond these walls, out into the world that is around us, the world that we are called to be his ambassadors to. And we've got to remember that, that our light is supposed to shine. This little light of mine... I'm going to let it shine. I'm not going to hide it under a bushel, no. I'm going to let it shine. Okay? We, we teach our kids that in song, but do we teach them that in life? Do we teach them that by example? Okay? So that's, that's just a small portion of what I believe there is a, a vision for this church. So there, there's a number of things. Before I was ever brought on as pastor, I sat down and I asked God, God, if you want me to do this, you need to let me know what I'm supposed to do. I've been to school, man. I know what a pastor is supposed to do. 90% of what a pastor is supposed to do, Scripture has no say on that. Scripture says nothing about that. But we've got this cultural idea of what a pastor should be. Well, I'll tell you what. According to the cultural idea, I'm not that. I'm not. Well, praise the Lord or not, this is what you got. <laughs> I am absolutely, earnestly convinced that my goal, my job, my, my job description is that I need to be praying and preaching the word. That's, that's what I am absolutely convinced scripture tells me I need to do. Okay? So, that's just part of the vision that God has given me for this church. Now, I've shared that with you so that you guys can participate in that vision. Now, I'm not saying you've got to jump on the Glenn bandwagon. I'm asking that you would take this before God, and if this is the case, jump on the God bandwagon. Okay? We'll ride it together. Okay. So, having said that, um, we're going to get into the Word. Um, we have been talking about our new identity, our identity in Christ. And we've covered a couple of points that I want to share with you. Uh, first, we are a new creation. Okay. Well, great, we're a new creation, but what does that mean? What does that new creation look like? We talked about we're no longer a slave to sin. Slave is, uh, sin is no longer our master. We are not bound to it any longer. We are reconciled to God. He being the offended party has made a way that we can be reconciled back to him. Okay? So we are children of God. He has given to us the right to be his children, to call him Abba Father. Now, the, the Abba Father, I've heard a lot about Daddy God, um, what, what really it means, it's intimacy. It's intimacy of relationship. And that idea that I was sharing with you before about the little children, that's what that image is. It's a child with their father, with their dad. Okay? That's the kind of relationship that God is looking for us in him. The absolute trust. I shared with you guys about my, my sons and swimming. Now, I don't know about some of you guys. I, my parents are very different when it comes to water. My dad sinks like a rock, and he swims like a fish. 
my mom can't sink to save her life. She goes out and she sits in the water and reads a book. No flotation device, she just sits and reads. Okay, now my children and I take after my dad. I hit the water and I'm immediately at the bottom. Okay, so when my kids were young, we would go to the pool and Christopher and Donovan would, would be on the edge <clears throat> and they were exactly opposite to how they approached the situation. Christopher would run right up to the edge. And then he's kind of checking the water. Kind of eyeballing me like, uh. And then it'd do this kind of like into my arms. Okay? And I would immediately dunk him. Okay? And then Donovan never stopped. And it didn't matter to Donovan whether I was paying attention or not. It didn't matter to Donovan that I'm holding his significantly heavier brother with both hands underwater. He's coming flying. And he's just cannonball. And that's the kind of trust that I believe God is asking of us. Running headlong and diving into the water. Um... 2014, a lot of you know 2014 was not a good year for me. It was an incredible year spiritually, but I went through some really tough stuff in 2014. One of the things that, that occurred, uh, I was praying one day, and I, and I felt like, you know, I felt like God was asking me to put my hand in the fire. And for those of you that have ever done that, you know it's not a pleasant thing. And I was praying one day, and I said, God, I don't want my hand in the fire anymore. And he said, no, you misunderstand me. I'm thinking, whew, okay. He said, I want all of you in the fire. I say, what? <laughs> I want all of you in the fire because that's where you will see my deliverance. I had to take <clears throat> some time and ponder going all the way in the fire. I don't believe I've gone all the way in the fire. I think maybe there's more of me in there now than there was in 2014, but I, I still have, I'm, I've got that Christopher mentality. You know, I've got one foot out and, and one foot in, and I'm checking to make sure God's going to catch me. And I need to have that, that, that faith where I will go in and trust my dad, that, that he's going to be my deliverer, okay? So we're children of God, and that, that child image is that innocence where your child completely and absolutely trusts you. Or where you, when you were a child, completely and absolutely trusted your dad. So we become, we have the right to be children of God. Okay? So, moving forward. Um, I, if you need the scripture references, please come and talk to me afterwards. Uh, we've covered these in previous messages. So, uh, today, turn to me with me to John chapter 15. <coughs> John chapter 15, I'm going to pick up in verse 12. Jesus is talking with his disciples, and this is what he says. <clears throat> so John 15, verse 12. This is my commandment. Okay, let's pause there for just a second. Okay. The, the first thing we need to understand is by the, the, the direction that Jesus has taken at the outset of what he's saying, there is a presumed authority. Okay. Now, we know, because of other scriptures, that Jesus has how much authority? Oh. All of it. All of it. So, when he says, this is my commandment, not only is he in the place to give that commandment, what does that tell us about us? We're in a place to receive it. That we are not his equal, that we are not in a place to refuse, 
This is a commandment. This is not a request. Jesus isn't saying here, you know, if you would like, I think it would be cool if. Or if you don't have anything better to do on a given day, you might consider this. Okay, so the first thing that we have got to understand is that Jesus is issuing a directive to us. It's a command. Now, keep in mind the relationship between man and God. Okay? Paul says that we are no longer slaves to sin, but we have become bond servants to Jesus Christ. Now, it's interesting the way that it's used, because it's the same word. But the way that the word is used in the structure indicates a willingness on our part. Okay? Now, you've, you've heard it said, and, and I'll, I'll, for those of you that have not, I'm going to share again. For those of you that have heard, make a note and draw a cool picture. <clears throat> when a person <coughs> was enslaved in Israel, how long could they be enslaved for? Seven years. No more than seven years. And, and actually, it didn't even work seven years because every seven years, all the slaves were released. So if you picked them up in the sixth year, guess what? You got them for a year. Okay? And then in the seventh year, all the slaves were released. But when you were released, if you chose, you could choose to willingly stay as a servant in your master's house. And, and this was signified by putting your ear up against the, the doorpost, and they would put an all through it. And then there would be a ring attached. And that meant that you had willingly embraced being a slave, a bond servant. You had of your own choice. Now, when you became a slave, it could have been not your choice. You could have been in debt and needed to put yourself in servitude to pay off the debt. There could have been a number of reasons why you became a slave. But when you put your ear and that thing went through and the ring was in your <coughs> ear, you were telling the world, I choose this. Okay? So, <clears throat> this is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. Now, the first part of that is problem enough. we got to love each other. Some of us are not particularly lovely. Okay? So, we're, we get this idea, uh, but I, I had a brother, I, well, I still have a brother. He's tried to get rid of me, I've tried to get rid of him, but we're still brothers. And he would say, I love you, but I don't like you. To which I would make some smart comment and then he'd hit me. But the, the concept that the directive is that we love each other. That's bad enough. But he doesn't end there, does he? Because see, as soon as we get this command that we have to love each other, we immediately put qualifiers on it, don't we? I will love you if. Or I will love you when. But what does he do with those qualifiers? He immediately gets rid of them because he doesn't end the statement there. That you love one another as. Uh-oh. Now, my flesh would say, as they love me. Hey, that's fair, right? It's easy to be loving toward someone when they're being loving toward you. <clears throat> That would work. Yeah. Then you got the question as to who loves first. Uh-oh. Well, of course, it's got to be them, right? But he doesn't even go that far. He says, as I have loved you. <coughs> now, you got to think about this. <coughs> Jesus has been with his disciples through a lot. He's been through a lot. And they, they have put him to the test. you got to think about some of the things that they pulled. Some of the boasts that Peter made. Some of the things that James and John did. It's bad enough that they want to sit at his right or left hand. But they bring mom into it. <laughs> hey, mom. Do you know 
how much he loves you. Surely he won't refuse you anything. He says, as I have loved you. Now, right there, you know, we get back into the Greek definitions of love, and both words used here are agape, agapeo, okay? That's unconditional. It's based on the giver, not the receiver. So we're already in trouble, right? Because if we're thinking of this in our own power, in our own strength, I'm hosed. I'm hosed. I'm very particular about certain things in my life. And when those things are not the way that I think they should be, I can get moody. Okay? I, I, can, I can have a temper. <clears throat> and if I'm trying to love you guys, as he has loved me in my own strength, guess what's going to happen? <laughs> he ain't getting much loving. That, that's just not going to happen. I can sustain it for a while, but eventually my own selfishness, my, my sin nature, the desire, that pattern of behavior that I had prior to coming to him is going to rear its ugly head and things are, the, the whole house of cards is going to fall down. Okay? But if I allow him to give me that love in me <clears throat> and I allow that love to fill me up and overflow, you guys are getting the same love he's given me just as an outflowing of who lives in me. But he doesn't even end there. He goes a step further. He says, <clears throat> Greater love has no man than this, that someone lay down his life for his friends. Aha! I'm off the hook. <laughs> you just don't have to be my friend. I can love you with a lesser love. No, that, that's not really what he's saying. Because he, he qualifies this. He says that you love them as I have loved you. And this is the full measure of the love that I have for you. I'm laying down my life for you. And I am absolutely convinced Jesus is not talking about just the cross. Because does his love for us end at the cross? Uh -uh. Did his love for the disciples end at the cross? Did his love for humanity end at the cross? No. His love for all of us is ongoing. It's perpetual. It's never ending. Okay? And it's the daily grind where we cause, where we run into trouble in expressing love, isn't it? It's, it's the commonality. It's the routine. And, and all of a sudden, we, love is not something that we're making a point to do anymore. It's just by rote and, and so we need that spirit living in us that same spirit that raised Christ from the dead living inside of us so that that love will be ongoing so uh, I, I am absolutely convinced that he's not talking about just the cross he's not telling us you only got to love them by laying down your life for them and all other areas you're off the hook I think he's telling us you got to love them in the details you got to love them in the nitty gritty you got to love them in the ugly, just like I love you, okay? So, um, <clears throat> let's go on a little bit further, because this is where I want to get to. All of that was free. <laughs> Greater love has no one than this, that someone lay down his life for his friends. Now, isn't that interesting? Because think of the relationship that the Almighty God has with humanity. We've already talked about slaves, we've talked about bond servants, but he uses a new phrase here, friends. And then he explains this even further. He says, you are my <coughs> friends. You are my friends. But there's a clause, there's a condition. What's the condition? Huh? Yeah, you. you have to do what he commands. What did he just command us? Love each other. To love each other. Okay? See, if we are loving each other, that puts us on friendly relations with God. It makes us his friend. Now, throughout all of Scripture, I can only recall one person that was ever called a friend of God. 
You guys know who that was? Abraham. Abraham, who was called God's friend. What a cool thing. Think about that for a minute. That the creator of the universe, the one who sustains all things, wants to be your friend. Now, you know, I know people have a lot of friends. I never have. Okay? Growing up, I always had one friend. That was all I ever wanted, one friend. Okay? And I had friendly acquaintances, but I only ever had one friend. And, you know, up to a certain point, it was this person, and then he moved away, and then it became this person, and then he moved away, and then I started thinking, I better quit this, because they're all moving away. <laughs> um, but, but as God started working in me and changing in me, he started making me realize that this love that I'm supposed to have for everybody makes me the same to you that it makes me to him. Do you know what I'm saying? Because see, if I follow this command to love you, and that makes Jesus want to be my friend, then that's going to make me want to be your friend. It's the same love that works from the top all the way down. And as you grow into this, and that love starts to fill you up and start flowing out from you, you're going to want to be our friend. You understand what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. And the condition, the, the measure of that friendship is going to be what? Greater love has no one than that he laid down his life for his friend. Now, I'm not asking you to take a bullet for me. I would ask you don't throw any bullets my way. <laughs> but I think it's a lot more in depth than that one time, one moment thing. I think the love that we have, the laying down of our lives, is just what Paul talks about when he says we need to prefer one another above ourselves. But I place you first. When you come to me, and there is something going on in your life, and I say, hey, you know what? Can you just give me until a commercial break? Yeah. <clears throat> Am I laying down my life for you? No, no. <clears throat> now, that's not to say there are not going to be times when something comes into your life and you're not going to be able to step into the gap for someone. Okay? And, and there may be a, you know, you may have something critical going on. You know, so you're getting ready to go in for open heart surgery and somebody says, hey, you got a few minutes? Okay? So, uh, uh, but the idea, the flow of this is that you prefer them and you are loving them by laying down your life on their behalf. Okay? So let's, let's look at this. And I just lost my place. <clears throat> so you are my friends if you do what I command you. The commandment is that you love each other as he loves us. Don't you hate it when he puts qualifiers on it? Mm -hmm. It's bad enough that, you know, he's telling me i got to love people that may be unlovely. But he's not only telling me that, he's telling me i got to love them the way that he loves me. We're absolutely, completely unconditional. <clears throat> but then in 15 he says, no longer do I call you servants. That's that bond servant that we were talking about. Now, the disciples that are here are here willingly. They've chosen this. They heard the call and they answered. Now keep in mind that there were a number of them that heard the call and turned away. Remember after the feeding of the 5,000? He went to the other side of the lake and they chased him down. What did they want? Breakfast. They got dinner last night. Hey man, this is like bed and breakfast. Pull up a spot on the lawn and he feeds you. So they followed him around and he said, Hey, look, I'm, you're missing the point of what I'm telling you. You just want food, but I'm talking about food that nourishes your soul. And what happened? Is he telling us we're not getting breakfast? I think he's telling us we're not getting breakfast. And off they went to Hardee's. A lot turned away, didn't they? They turned away. So... At this point, 
these that are there with them have gone through a lot of these things where others have turned away. And he's telling them, I am no longer calling you bondservant. I'm no longer calling you what is the rightful position between me as Lord and you as not Lord. Between me as king and you as not king. I'm changing the entire dynamic of this such that I'm calling you friends. No longer do I call you servants, for the servant does not know what his master is doing. But I have called you friends, for all that I have heard from my father I have made known to you. Now, now think about that for a minute. How often do you suppose Jesus heard from the father? I don't know that we can answer that. Because he is God. You know, at one and the same time that he is fully man, and we know he prayed, and we know he separated himself from others to spend time with his Father, he's still God. And that whole dynamic is something that my brain can't wrap itself around very well. So, while I know that he prayed a lot, I don't know that he was continually communing with the Father in a conscious form. I, I don't know how that worked. And quite honestly, without reading into Scripture, I don't think you can either. Being God and yet communing with God. Okay? So I, I don't understand how that works. But everything that God spoke to him, he spoke to the disciples. And I believe he is still speaking to the disciples Today, the disciples being us. All of us. He is speaking to us. Now, I believe that that speaking is coming through the Word and through the Holy Spirit. See, this is the guidelines. This is the outline whereby we can judge what we receive as being from God or not. But this isn't all of it. This has not been fleshed out. Remember what John says at the end of his book? If I told you everything he did, I suppose it would take all the paper in the world. Okay? So this is just the guideline. This is what we form the basis. We know that it should take this shape. And then when God speaks with us and deals with us, we can hold that in light of this and find out whether it be true. Okay? So he says, everything that I've heard from the Father, I have heard, I have made known to you. Then he says something really cool. He says, you did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you that you should go and bear fruit and that your fruit should abide so that whatever you ask the Father in my name, he may give it to you. Now, I know there are some people that take that and they start asking for boats, bigger houses, bigger bank accounts. I, that's not what he's talking about, God. Uh, people, because God, God is not concerned about the temporal things of this earth as much as we are. I mean, he tells us, don't worry about what you will eat, what you will drink, or what you wear. Why are you worrying about your bank account? Why are you worrying about a better car, a bigger house? And I just don't get why people want boats. <laughs> okay. But hey, I mean, if that's your thing... Now, I want to back up for a second because I had a, 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 an epiphany the other day. How many men in here fish? Richie, put your hand up. Put both hands up, Richie. <laughs> oh, come on. Richie's like, I, I fish. No, you don't. You're like, I fish! <laughs> capital F, capital I, capital S, capital H. Now, Dennis fishes through the ice. Now, I struggle to relate to Richie I can't even make that connection with Dennis. So now you've got a fish. Yay. <laughs> what am I going to do with the darn thing? Oh, take it home and eat it. Uh -uh. No. If I take that into the house and I show it to Christy, we're both going to have problems. Christy, don't do fish. Okay? But think about this for a minute because I was pondering this. Who were the first disciples of Jesus called? Fishermen. The area that he started was populated 
by fishermen. This was the normal craft, that was the popular craft job of that area. Now he went from Nazareth up to the north part of Galilee, or to the, the Sea of Galilee, and he drew from the fishermen first. Now, think about how many times throughout the Gospels we find these same men fishing with Jesus. Hey, Rich, you ever think Jesus is fishing beside you? All the time. All the time. Think about that for a minute. That just completely blew my mind because um, I was actually, I had gone over the, the reading and I was looking over my notes and then I got on Facebook and the first thing I saw was Travis Jones. <laughs> Now, I know Richie likes to fish, and I know Dennis likes to fish, and I know Scott likes to fish. I don't think Travis likes to fish. I think it's like in his lifeblood. And the first thing that I saw was Travis holding a fish, and you know he's got this fish in the camera doing a fish face, and he's got this big grin on his face. And that's when God just spoke to me that as his friend, he's there fishing with Travis. Uh -huh. And he's sitting there, and, and he's going, hey, try, try that pool over there. Try that pool over there. And I, I'm absolutely convinced that God's like, okay, fish, jump on the line. <laughs> we know he did it. Yeah. Because he told Peter, hey, go down, cast your line into the water, and the first fish you pull up will have the money into its mouth, go pay my tax and yours. What do you think the fish felt like? <laughs> He's down there minding his own business and boom! <laughs> and then God puts him on the line. I mean, the fish lost both ways. He lost his coin and he lost his line. <laughs> it's a bad day. But the idea that God is your that he chose to fish with Peter and Andrew and James and John. He chose to do those things that they did. He chose to be with them. And that I am absolutely convinced holds true today. That whatever it is that you are participating in, Jesus wants to be right there. He is that friend that sticks closer than a brother. Amen? Amen. So take that thought home with you this week. Jesus has called you friend. Father, we bless you. And I thank you, God, that you have chosen to be our friend. I thank you that you have made a way that we can be friends. And I ask, God, that you would just open our minds and reveal to us what that looks like. Father, we have so distorted the idea of relationship with you. We have so sterilized it. We've made it something almost unnatural. <coughs> and yet your word tells us that you walked in the cool of the evening with Adam. And I ask, Lord God, that you would just show us this week what that looks like in our lives. Father, prepare us to be your friend. Thank you, in Jesus' name, amen.